Welcome back to the Crash Bandicoot block of Pace Summer 2023. Uh, if you are a fan of Coco Bandicoot, or if you're a fan of go-karts, or if you're a fan of Coco Bandicoot in a go-kart, then I've got the run for you. This is 8VA Luigi running Crash Team Racing, any percent, no major glitches. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Summer 2023. Uh, my name is 8VA, or 8VA Luigi, as it is displayed on Twitch. Um, we are going to be playing Crash Team Racing, any percent, no major glitches. This is a PS1 game, but we are going to be playing it on a PS2 because of a feature called Fast Disk Speed. It's pretty self-explanatory. You put a PS1 disc in, you toggle Fast Disk Speed on, it loads the game faster. Um, so we're going to be playing no major glitches, which does include skips. The true any percent category of this game involves going into battle mode with two controllers, dying a bunch of times, and then somehow that warps to the credits. I, don't ask me, I can't explain it. But we're going to go on ahead with the main category of the game, and timing will start in classic marathon countdown fashion. Three, two, one, go. All right, so... Um, Naughty Dog's last installment into the Crash Bandicoot franchise was CTR, uh, and they really went all out with a plot line here. Basically, there's a big green alien that sees that we enjoy racing, which we like barely see in Crash 3 with a couple motorcycle and jet ski levels. But anyway, he sees that we like racing, and he apparently goes around the galaxy to challenge uh, the best racer of each planet to uh, a deathmatch race. If we win, he leaves us alone. If we lose, he transforms our entire globe into a parking lot and enslaves the population. We don't want that. So the best way to uh, curtail his uh, evil plan is by sliding around and driving sideways in a go-kart. You're going to see a lot of that. Um, basically what we do is we fill up this boost gauge in the bottom right corner uh, as close to full as we can, there are going to be some spots where we'll either cut the line a little bit shorter or just drive in a straight line. But for the most part, driving sideways is how we achieve it. Um, what we do after we build up these uh, boost gauges, we call those reserves. Whenever we do boost, we gain reserves. Whenever we're not boosting, we're losing them. So it's a nice game of cat and mouse here. And this first level crash cove is a pretty good indicator of uh, how we get that done. Basically, we go off of one turbo pad towards the end of lap one, and we're able to keep that fire all the way to the end of the race, hopefully, just by filling up that boost meter. We don't actually have a full stack of reserves at the beginning of lap one, and I actually dropped mine a bit from marathon nerves there, but we are able to just carry this all to the end of the lap pretty decently. So that right there is Crash Cove, and um, in the next... Uh, trophy race that we have, Ruse Tubes. We're going to go on ahead and explain one of the other fundamentals to moving in this game at a fast rate. Uh, we have 16 trophies that we need to achieve in four hubs. Every four trophies that we win in a hub, we unlock a boss race. Once we beat the bosses, they give us a key. And then after we get four keys, we race the final boss, Nitrous Oxide, the big green alien man. Okay. So, at various points in the game, but mostly downhills, we're going to acquire some additional speed. And uh, we're going to call that either a Speed Ghost or an SG for short. Uh, basically, even though I don't have a full stack of reserves, my speedometer went up all the way. And the reason for that is because the downhills give us some artificial speed. The way that we maintain some of the artificial speed is by abusing the game's input buffer system by holding L1, one of the jump buttons, and then mashing R1, the other jump button. This kind of confuses the game into thinking that we're in some sort of like both grounded and aerial state and preserves the speed from a speed ghost. This tech is called Froggy, um, which is just hilarious. And there are even more techs in this game that sound like a 12-year-old made them up. Um, one of which is a really funny one called Ultimate Sacred Fire, but we won't get there for a long time. But yeah, this is Ruse Tubes. We take a little intended shortcut there by uh, cutting through that little patch of grass with the mushroom next to it. It's not that hard to skip unless we have a lot of speed coming from that speed ghost. That final SG can actually give us quite a bit. 
it hasn't been giving us it so far, but we do have multiple attempts to get it done. And yeah, it's not going to give us anything particularly great at the moment. But we are going to probably go into this 26, 25, 25. These aren't bad lap times. Um, they're, they're just uh, a bit average. But yeah, now the next track that we have, Mystery Caves, I, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk about Wumpa Fruit earlier, but unfortunately the game just didn't give me the RNG to get it. Get a TNT crate. But now we absolutely have to talk about Wumpa Fruit. Uh, they pretty much function the same way that coins in Mario Kart do. You get them, the cart goes faster. That's only applicable to Wumpa 1 through 9. The 10th Wumpa will just make our items stronger. It'll upgrade the item from, like, let's say, a TNT to a Nitro or a Green Beaker to a Red Beaker. But yeah, we're going to see Speed Ghosts, Reserves, a couple cycles here, like this Turtle gives us a nice bounce. Going off of big jumps will also give us more Reserves. So that's always a nice added bonus. We have a nice SG going down this hill. And I lied when I said it's mostly downhills because there's also uphill speed ghosts, like you'll see here. We'll carry it through here, and then, nice, we got that second bounce by also using the buffer system. But yeah, we got a, a Wumpa crate there heading into the initial speed ghost. We also took a little detour there on lap one to give us a uh, second uh, dose of Wumpa. Now we have 10. And the reason that you get a bunch of Wumpa in this game is because, like, one, it makes the cart go faster, but as the track gets longer, you start seeing its effects more and more. If I drive well, I should be able to get either a 39 or 38 second lap. And these fireballs are also on a very avoidable and predictable cycle, so they shouldn't be that hard to navigate around. My movement was a little clunky there, but it's not going to lose too much time. And yeah, one of the main objectives of CTR, just like from a speedrun or time trial standpoint, is going to be like sometimes we are going to hug these walls really tight. Um, if we have some good cornering, that's going to very much help us along the way. This will lose a little bit of time just because I wasn't able to maintain reserves from lap to lap. But we should get some pretty decent speed here on this SG. Froggy it out and take it to the end of the lap. So I'm sure the answer is because she's the coolest, but uh, why do you play as Coco? Um, well, one, you know, see previous answer. But also, <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I could go into a couple reasons for why. But um, basically, there's eight characters that are playable in adventure mode in CTR. Uh, only four of them are viable, and those are the characters in speed and acceleration class. Speed is Tiny and Dingo Dial. They go extremely fast and are considered to be like pretty much optimal at this point. But um, Acceleration was thought to be the most viable character choice for a majority of the game's lifespan. Um, and I like them just because they have a better turn stat and uh, Coco has the good mask. And uh, also, if I pick the other Acceleration character, who's Engine, I get this really weird glitch that I don't think is unique to my PS2, but um, I think a few PS2s with fast disk speed, uh, <laughs> whenever you go from one hub to the next and it plays that sound of the creaking boss garage door, uh, that sound just plays on a loop every time I transition from hub to hub. So it's just this never ending <laughs> sound for like a good like 14 or 15 seconds each time I complete a boss race, so we'd rather not have that. But yeah, Coco and Engine, as well as Tiny and Dingo Dial are the viable choices in the game. Unfortunately, uh, Crash and Cortex and um, Polar and Pura are just uh, not that good. The interesting thing about Crash and Cortex, though, is that they're kind of just slow versions of a character that's only accessible through cheat codes on the PAL and NTSCJ version of the game, and that's Penta Penguin. You can unlock Penta Penguin in this game with a cheat code, but he has the same stats as Polar and Pura for whatever reason. But yeah, um, he has max stats. He's the best character for a majority of time trials in the game. There are some where speed characters are still optimal. Yeah, so um, Sewer Speedway is the fourth and final trophy race of Hub 1 here. 
And um, these barrels are once again on a pretty consistent and predictable cycle. There are some spots where the SG at the end of the level can kind of uh, make you either go too fast or too slow into the next lap. Interestingly enough, if you are able to get a speed ghost on this wall here, it doesn't really matter that much if the barrel hits you. Thank you for that, Cortex. Um, because you can just like keep the extra speed from that speed ghost and go pretty fast. Um, the world record of acceleration time trials in Sewer Speedway actually does get squished by the barrel on lap three, and like, it doesn't matter at all. All right, so now we have our first boss of the game, Ripper Roo, who just kind of laughs at us with subtitles. Um, shout out to my friend Drew NG. I don't know if you're watching, but um, in my splits, this is called Drew NG Look Away because Drew had this game when he was six years old, much like I did, and he said that that cutscene gave him nightmares, which I, I can't say I blame him there. Even though Ripper Roo is a pretty goofy character, uh, he is certain that tackle doesn't uh, go away. You might notice I placed down a TNT there. Um, the reason being, I didn't do that in the first trophy race because there's a chance none of the AIs could actually hit it. But because the uh, bosses throw so many items behind them infinitely, I can literally just place that TNT and that, along with all the items that Ripper Rear threw down, will just despawn immediately. But yeah, overall, uh, we're just racing on Roost Tubes again, but this time there's only one AI racer, so feel free to uh, read some donations if you've got them. All right, I do have a couple. Millie 494 donates $25 and says, good luck to my favorite CTR runner out there. So proud of you, and I hope you get all the Mickey Mouse skips. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Millie. Uh, shout out to Millie. Uh, that's my wife. Uh, and she is the absolutely most supportive wife in all the land. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad that she said Mickey Mouse skips because there's something that I consider to be a bit of a soft skip later in the game that could be great and could not be great. But she also despises the term Mickey Mouse. So I'm glad she uh, conceded there. I also despise the term Mickey Mouse. <laughs> All right, um, if you have more donations, I'm just going to drive to the next hub world. All right, there is also a $20 donation from Will Barker, who says, Hogwarts Champion. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, uh, one thing that I think is awesome about CTR, uh, this is also present in Diddy Kong Racing on the N64. Shout out to that game. It rules. Um, is that we actually have, like, an adventure mode for as bad as the plot is at least we have like an actual world that we traverse through uh, and like in that way we kind of like feel like we're making legitimate progress as opposed to like most kart racers of the time are like just kind of an all cups category which this game does have by the way and you can use the cheat code character penta penguin on pal or ntscj so here we're in the first uh trophy race of hub 2 this is called tiger temple and this can be a bit precarious in a way because there's a shortcut that is dependent on RNG, which can be annoying. I need an item that I can throw forward here, which I did get. The uh, beaker in this game is similar to a banana peel in Mario Kart where the default is to throw it behind you, but by angling either the stick or the D-pad, I can throw it in either direction. I missed a turbo pad there, which is really unfortunate because now I just like won't have reserves through like all of lap two. And I also need to chuck this nitro behind me in hopes that I get a better item. You might have noticed there are some item boxes uh, at the beginning of the lap. It's actually quicker to just forego those item boxes and miss the shortcut than it is to go wide in the hopes that you get a good item. And unfortunately, we got a Nitro there, which can only be placed behind us. But now we have a bomb on Hub 3, which is, or sorry, Lap 3, not Hub 3. So yeah, Lap 3, we'll get a bomb. We'll be able to open that door, no problem. And yeah, we cut through this grass a little bit here. And now I'm able to actually do this lap with reserves, which is nice. I did not have those before. 
Um, an interesting point about uh, this door, I, I always take the opportunity to mention this whenever I can, is that uh, getting a TNT or a Nitro isn't necessarily a bad thing if you have a shield item. Because if you have a shield item, you can throw that at the door um, and, or a, and then drop a TNT behind you, and it'll just leave the door open permanently, which is nice as long as you get out of the way of your own item on the next lap. Okay, the next race of Hub 2, we've got a little home field advantage here because this is Coco Park. As Aku Aku absolutely vibes us saying, you can go faster. Um, in my splits, that that plays whenever I am behind. Anyway. He, uh, he, he clearly watched the Twin Sanity run right before this. <laughs> I was like, man, like, I know. <laughs> it's a hard game. But yeah, if we mash at the perfect point, uh, he just tells us that we can go faster, which is really funny. The actual dialogue is something about like going faster through turns by power sliding through them. And yeah, so Coco Park is pretty akin to like a uh, Luigi circuit in like a Mario Kart. It's a very like basic oval shape, but there are some fancy speed ghosts like right here. We'll carry that into the next turbo pad and then have some reserves going into the next lap. This shortcut right here, going up this grass hill, can be really annoying to deal with. If we, like, nick parts of the texture in a weird way by frogging up it, it can just completely destroy all of the speed we've built up, which is bad. We don't want that. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and get this speed ghost here, carry it into the turbo pad. These laps aren't bad. Yeah. I've been kind of dissatisfied with a couple other laps going thus far, but this is going pretty well. Yeah, the reserves in this game, if you like hit any type of wall or anything that just halts you immediately, you just lose all of it. Yeah, so that's why bonking the walls can be extremely troublesome. There's also like, we don't want to necessarily spend too much time in the air without doing what's called a mid-air turbo. Um, there are some spots where it's really easy to get those but some spots where it might be just better to take a straight line. So sometimes lower jumps can be better than higher ones. Congratulations. Okay, so the first seven like splits, so to speak, of this game are the exact same as we do in a category called skipless, where we don't do any unintended shortcuts. But here in Papu's Pyramid, this is where that all changes. The world record holder, Hypnoshark, goes for an absolutely ridiculous variant of this shortcut. We won't be going for that today, but we will be combining a blend of intended and unintended shortcuts to make this lap a lot quicker than the developers likely wanted it to be. And we're just going to have Crash suffer the wrath of that TNT, because why not? So yeah, we're going to take an intended shortcut here, just going through that grass and getting a jump to maintain some reserves, jump off this pillar jump here in part of the track, go back onto part of the track, and then jump onto this wall. You can kind of tell the game doesn't necessarily want us to be there by the way the cart kind of bounces on it. Um, what Hypnoshark does there is a skip called the Tiziano shortcut. And uh, what happens there is that this game has a pretty tightly coded progression system where you can't skip more than 25% of the track at once. Other than on here, which for some reason has what's called a no mask zone where you don't get respawned, um, what he does is he gets a mask at the beginning, which is similar to a star in Mario Kart. Makes you go very fast, makes you invincible, and just jumps straight from that last wall to the end of the lap. And time trailers can actually get it without a mask, um, which is absolutely mind boggling. You can either get it for a single lap world record or go for it uh, without any build-up whatsoever. But yeah, there's Papu, uh, Papu's Pyramid. I'm really happy that I was able to get that shortcut three out of three. My PB does not get that three out of three. So I'm extremely happy it, it, about that. It is deceptively harder than it looks. There's a nice easier variant that you can do without that grass shortcut by going a bit wide and guaranteeing yourself reserves by hitting a turbo pad. But that loses about two seconds per lap. Interestingly enough, uh, there are three different buttons that you have to mash in this game, which can get a bit confusing for a new runner. 
So anytime that we're at the start of this race, we mash triangle. We also mash triangle for the mask cutscenes that give us hints, which are actually going to be over after this race, which is nice because we get to do something else that could save us some time. It's not guaranteed. And then uh, when we're done with the race, we hit X after it displays us the leaderboard. And then when we're out of the race, after we hit X to get out of it, when it displays us the leaderboard, there's a podium cutscene that hopefully we never see because we mash start to get out of that. So <laughs> three different buttons to mash. Uh, don't know why that is, but Naughty Dog otherwise made like the best kart racer ever, in my opinion. Uh, some of you might think otherwise, but that's okay. Because I, mean, I, mean, I mean, me personally, the only one I like more is its remake, so kind of, kind of basically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, CTR Nitro Fueled is also a great game. Uh, a lot of the techs, like doing full turbos and, uh, you know, keeping your reserves, those do carry over, but there are a lot less unintended shortcuts. And uh, the loads are also pretty long, but it does use loadless timing, which is really nice because it means that all platforms can be played on it. Yeah, the loads are probably like the biggest deterrent with that game. They're just, uh, especially if you're on an older gen console, they're pretty miserable. Yeah. But like when you actually get to play the game, it is very, very close in quality to this game. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> at least it was the last lap. Yeah, and at least I, I, I like angled so hard to the left out of that. Uh, just because if I had kept going straight, I would have just fallen right into the pit there. Um, yeah, so Dingo Canyon, we, we talked right through it, but um, the level just like has a big speed ghost on that one downhill, uh, and then otherwise there isn't much to it. Those armadillos are pretty avoidable, but uh, I did not avoid the very last one. Best part of this run is that every time you go into a boss garage, you just hear Coco crash into the wall and go, ow! Yeah. For whatever reason, uh, before it like actually loads the race, you just drive straight into the wall of the boss garage. And uh, Dingo Dial sound is just a little grunt. But uh, Coco and Engine both have a really funny, like, very pronounced ow sound. Uh, so Papu took an amazing line there at the start which really got in my way. I'm going to try and hit this shortcut with, like, no reserves. Okay, that's fine because we have a backup, which is an intended shortcut. And the way that we cut a really sharp turn there is by uh, what's called U-turning. Uh, basically, what we do there is we hold it down, and then we hold the direction we want to turn, and we also hold the brake button, which is square. And what that does is it cuts a really sharp turn at the expense of your reserves because you're braking but it's still very uh, useful in situations like that where otherwise you would go really wide. And we're already like sacrificing a bit of time by going for the backup there. Also, if as a kid you thought Papu Papu's race icon was like the, the center red part was like a big clown nose and not his mouth, uh, you are not the only one. <laughs> All right, time for the best Johns ever. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, just listen. The the best Johns of all time. He lost because he didn't eat big enough of a breakfast. Which, uh, you know, if, if you speedrun at marathons or if you play competitive Smash or if you play a sport, you know, those, those Johns can be ever-present. And uh, we are inside the Xanadu Games venue where I do have to give a shout-out to them uh, and VGBC for letting us use their space. Uh, they are a tremendous help to the Smash community as well as the gaming community as a whole. And uh, this event being held at Laurel Park and Xanadu Games is very emblematic of that. So shout out to Gimmer and Apostle, shout out VGBC, shout out Xanadu. I have been part of the uh, Smash community in MDVA for quite some time, so. As have I. It is great to see, you know, the worlds collide here. So Blizzard Bluff, this track is awesome because there's nine shortcuts, three per lap, and they all go by very quickly. 
the first shortcut, uh, I kind of rammed straight into the wall, but it's fine. Uh, we go through that little pile of snow at the beginning, then we take this intended shortcut here, and then we take this intended question mark, unintended question mark shortcut there where we skip over that fence. That is extremely likely to fail, but um, what we do is a double jump where we, again, abuse the game's buffer system. That boulder there at the beginning of the lap is the only thing in this game that runs on a global cycle, meaning that uh, it's running the second you like power the game up. Nice fence skip. Hopefully we're able to get that three out of three. Um, unfortunately, if you type exclamation point fence skip in this chat, nothing will happen. But if you type it in my chat, it's a very cut and dry response of the fence skip speedrun strat is what happens when you skip the fence. Um, anyway. Yeah, that boulder can be in all sorts of patterns because, uh, again, it runs on a global cycle. Everything else starts when you actually start up the race. Cool. Three out of three fence skip there. And now I am going to mash the ever-living garbage out of my start button. For every race in Hub 3 and 4 that doesn't have a uh, boss cutscene preceding it, I can mash the start button and hope that I hit it on the right frame. Um, my mask, Aku Aku, says, congratulations, you win a trophy. But I can make it just go, congratulations, Bing! and it'll save about uh, two seconds to have him not do the rest of the dialogue if I pause and unpause really quickly. Okay, so from here on out, this run gets challenging. Um, Blizzard Bluff was already challenging, but we got that three out of three. Um, so here, this minecart absolutely flies in the American version of the game. Uh, ow. I was just cutting that line a bit too tight. This is going to lose a lot of time, but I still want to illustrate the shortcut. Um, basically, what we're going to do is take the same path that the minecart does. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out too well here. But we should be able to cut in front of the AI just fine. Uh, on the PAL version of this game, the minecart actually goes a lot slower. Um, and it's an interesting point about uh, the NTSC and PAL versions of the game because both of them are pretty viable for uh, this category for speedrunning and just playing CTR in general because sometimes some speed ghosts are a bit stronger on the PAL version of the game. This is a deceptively difficult track just to like maintain reserves and just because its layout is very rough for that, and there's only one turbo pad in the entire track. Yeah. I usually just, like, try my best to uh, go in to the next laps with a fair amount of reserves so I can, like, take full advantage of the downhill that gives me a big SG. Which I was able to get uh, a couple times. The beginning of the race can also be really annoying. Also, if you are new to running this game, or are just looking for general tips, do not jump at the end of that lap. You unlock bonus DLC. You unlock lap four, uh, <laughs> which is not good. <laughs> it pretty much instantly kills the run. Uh, it can also happen in Papu's Pyramid if we go over the finish line on that wall shortcut. But yeah, unlocking the DLC is not very good in that game. It just doesn't count the lap for whatever reason if you jump over the finish line in Dragon Mines. All right, we're, here we have our second snow level. This is Polar Pass. This is a pretty big run killer because the skip uh, can be a bit inconsistent at times. Um, there's two variants of it. I hope to perform both of them. The first one is called Slingshot. It's a bit easier, and you can probably see why it's called a Slingshot. Basically, what we're going to do here is hit this turbo pad, drive the wrong way, hit this wall, and then skip over that lake right there. That is a really hard skip. It involves a double jump where I hit uh, one jump and then jump off of the wall as well. Um, it's pretty tough. And then the second variant of it is even harder. I plan on going for that on lap three. But yeah, with Polar Pass, um, it's a really interesting track. The seals are on predictable and avoidable cycles, but you have to take a really tight line to avoid the next one and still have like a pretty optimal uh, approach. So yeah, I'm just gonna try and like squeeze this wall really hard. Okay, awesome. So now we're gonna go for another slingshot here. Oh, I don't know about this. 
Okay, nice. nice. The the setup was really wide, but I was still able to time the jump correctly. And we're going to take this little shortcut here. This is pretty intentional, you can tell, because there's boxes. And by the way, the way to uh, distinguish intended versus unintended shortcuts, at least for the category rules of skipless, um, is basically if there's boxes, or sorry, time crates in uh, relic race mode for 101%, then like it's cool for you to be there. Or if uh, Oxide's ghost in time trial mode um, takes the shortcut, you're good to go for it. So here we're going to try to do the boomerang. Oh, okay. We got the good failure of boomerang because we can just do slingshot as a backup without like landing in the lake. Um, what boomerang is supposed to do there is just bypass the need to go backwards on that turbo pad altogether. Uh, but unfortunately, it's really hard to set up and I just wasn't able to do it. Um, I went a little too wide of the wall. It's actually better to fail it that way, because otherwise if you get the first jump and not the second, you just land in the lake. All right, that's Polar Pass. Now, here's where the fun begins. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, one of the great things about CTR is that it has a very global community. Um, and there's a huge time trial scene uh, in Italy that does most of their communication on Facebook. Uh, but they have a term for any shortcut discovered after 2019 that looks kind of ridiculous. That term is called embrugliament, which in uh, Neapolitan Italian slang just translates to cheating. Uh, this is the biggest example of embrugliament that there is in the entire game. So there are some RNG elements. I'm going to have to get two Wumpa crates to give me 10 Wumpa fruit and a TNT, which if I get it here will be a TNT. But if I get it later, it'll be a Nitro. That is a first try RNG, which is really nice. Um, I don't often go for this skip in runs, but this is a marathon and it deserves to be showcased. Um, if for nothing else, just to see just how silly this skip can be. Um, the, if I get this on one lap, and choose not to go for it on another, I will save 41 seconds. If I get it on two laps, I will save a minute and 12 seconds. If I fail it on one lap and succeed on another, I will still save 23 seconds. So it is uh, a pretty polarizing skip because you can kind of luck into it, but you can also set it all up correctly and still not achieve it. This is called Tiny Arena Skip. What we're going to do is place this nitro against the wall. I'm not in love with that placement, but we'll see. Oh, that was so close. So yeah, what you want to do is drive into the center right of the nitro, and hopefully that is able to give you enough height and distance to propel you over the wall and count your lap. If I'm able to get it on lap two, my lap three will be 18 seconds long as opposed to uh, it being over a minute like it was uh, on lap one. Yeah, it, this is the longest track in the game and it just cuts out an astronomical amount of it to get that skip. But yeah, otherwise, what you want to do in Tiny Arena if you're going for it without the skip, which please go for it without the skip. Um, what you're going to do is just focus on having good fundamentals, playing good CTR, driving well. You can like get your lap times to be like 107, 105, 105, that's pretty good. Um, and you can cut it even lower just by doing good strategies and uh, not getting caught on too many pieces of uh, the tops of hills or whatever. But because this is a marathon, we're gonna try to take full advantage of the skip that we have here. Nice, Yo, let's go. Let's go. Oh my god. That uh, that skip is pretty cursed in marathons, so I'm really happy to get that once. Um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, that is what I was referring to as a Mickey Mouse skip because honestly, I was not in love with the placement of the Nitro, nor was I happy with driving into it, and I somehow was still able to get it anyway. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. That lap was an 18xx in lap three. And now Komodo Joe talks to us forever. 
Anyway, uh, if we play the PAL version of this game, this cutscene is skipped entirely. And uh, there are some crazy differences between NTSC and PAL, which hopefully Rico will explain as I try and redeem myself in Dragon Mines here. Yeah, so the, the reason the PAL version can still compete with NTSC, even though it does play at a lower frame rate, uh, is there is a bug in the game called the language glitch. So when you boot up the PAL version, before it takes you to the menu, it asks you what language you want to play in. And the devs did not account for you pressing triangle, which is the cancel button, and as a result, not picking a language. And if you do that on the language select menu, the game just loads with no language, so no dialogue plays. Uh, all of the cutscenes get messed up, like the boss's head swap, like you'll have Papu Papu with with pin stripes, but the biggest uh, the biggest thing is that it just skips the first Komodo Joe cutscene, and like that by itself almost brings PAL to be like on the same amount of like speed as NTSC. So PAL is still very much competitive just because of the language glitch. It was actually considered to be optimal for a long time before we realized that you know the American version having the better frame rate just leads to more consistent driving. And I, I think another thing was that it was discovered eventually that this game is actually optimal on a fat PS2, whereas most most PS1 games are optimal on a on a slim one. And that that like reduction of lag on a fat console also helped with the NTSC version. Yeah, so I, I'm playing on the most optimal NTSC U console for the game, which is a PS2 39001. Um, it's still super viable on basically any model of PS2. The 39001 is good, and the 50K is also good. Slim PS2s, as long as you're playing on a 70K, it's still pretty manageable. It doesn't lag the game that much. But if you're playing it on the very latest and greatest PS2 that I think stopped production in about 2012, the 90K, uh, the mask hints load unbelievably slowly. There is a uh, comparison of uh, Red Hot and Hypnoshark um, and their two PS2s that they've used to load, or sorry, to run the game. The mask loads are ridiculous, and the lag between hubs is actually just nutty. It's actually like a borderline slideshow in some spots. Yeah. And it's such an anomaly because most PS1 and PS2 games, the later your PS2 model is, the better it runs, and CTR is just the outlier. Shout out to the very rare instance where having a 70K slim PS2 is optimal. Shout out to Spyro the Dragon, another game that I run. All right, so here we're heading, uh, heading into a Hub 4, which is debatably the hardest in the game. Hub 3 is pretty hard as well because of uh, Fence Skip, Slingshot, Boomerang, Tiny Arena Skip. But um, this just by and large has like the hardest tracks as a whole. Uh, we start off with Engine Labs, which is a bit of a calm before the storm. And yeah, that turbo pad right there is what's called a super turbo pad, which is what it's officially called in the game. What it's not called in the game officially is what it gives us, which is USF or Ultimate Sacred Fire. I do have to give a shout out to a member of my Twitch community who called it something awesome. Uh, shout out to Sour Melon SSBM for calling it the Bandicoot Scoot. Um, <laughs> I think that rules and is like equally as awesome as Ultimate Sacred Fire. So yeah, we hit that turbo pad twice and it gives us an insane amount of speed. Yeah, so with, with USF, it, it just, it caps out your speed uh, at the cost of, if you get any other turbo boost that's not a USF, uh, you go back down to the non-USF. So you basically just, you let the USF go until your reserves run out. Yeah, and it's really important to not kill it immediately by jumping off the turbo pad. You do not want to jump, whereas in a lot of other turbo pad scenarios, like jumping just kind of seems second nature. You do not want to jump off the turbo pads because if you jump, you get a landing boost and goodbye USF. But yeah, this uh, lap three is going to be more or less the same. So if you have donations, please go on ahead. All right, I do have one. Uh, Bofan donates $25 with the message, Warning, 8VA. Good luck on the run. Hope you're having a blast at pace. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, you know, huge shout-out to uh, my Twitch community for 
throwing in some donations, being up very late at night for us East Coasters. And uh, just shout out to CTR in general. Again, it's a very global community of people from all around the world playing both NTSC and PAL, um, contributing in uh, you know time trials and speed runs. Um, it's really pretty great. Unfortunately, I lost USF from uh, lap two to lap three, so that last bit lost a bit of time, but that's quite all right. This run is going uh, pretty well. I think I've got you know some marathon jitters and whatever have you, but I like how it's going. Okay, so here we're just gonna jump down here and go to Cortex Castle. This is probably, in my opinion, the hardest track in the game that doesn't have unintended shortcuts. Reason being, the corners are really tight, similar to like a Bowser's Castle in a Mario Kart game. Um, and then also, for whatever reason, the AI is really mean here at the start. But hopefully they don't mess with us too much. The reason that this level is pretty hard with either class of characters that are viable for speedruns is that if you're playing as Dingo or Tiny, you have to take extremely precise lines without much room to improvise. And then with Coco and Engine, you want to take lines that also have you going around these uh, tight corners while still trying to maintain reserves. Reason being is there's a USF pad at the end of the lap, which is really uh, like crucial to giving you a lot of speed into the next one. We'll see, I lost reserves going into the second turbo pad, but it's, uh, okay. So yeah, it's not gonna give me too much there. Still a 47XX, but a really high one at that. Hopefully I'm able to do it a little bit better on lap two. Yeah, how you do that first ramp is just a uh, real like determinant for how the rest of the race will go. USF is something that didn't quite exactly transition into Crash Team Racing Nitro Field, but there's something extremely similar, which is Blue Fire. Uh, which is the si similar idea that it just gives you a tremendous speed boost. The difference is that you can actually carry blue fire through other turbo pads. Those spiders are once again on like pretty predictable and avoidable cycles. Um, the time trial strat is that you'll cut the line really tight around that right wall and just avoid the spider entirely, whether it's up or down. Um, I do want to shout out another member of my Twitch community who to this day might have said the funniest thing ever uh, in my Twitch channel, um, and that's uh, Internet Mother. Um, they basically said, <laughs> when I had this game as a kid, I would pause around the spiders, watch them go up and down, and hear their cute spider sounds. And for whatever reason, that is very much stuck with me, and I think about it just basically every time. Um, okay. They do make cute spider sounds. Yes, they do. Yeah, that USF just not quite working out. Okay. So the last four splits of this game are Hot Air Skyway and then Oxide Station. And then it's so nice we have to do it twice because we do Hot Air Skyway and Oxide Station again. Um, we race the final boss of Hub 4, Pinstripe, on Hot Air Skyway and then we race the final boss of the game, Nitrous Oxide, on Oxide Station. Um, I said that Cortex Castle was the hardest track in the game without unintended shortcuts. Hot Air Skyway and Oxide Station are the hardest tracks in the game, period, uh, more or less because of their unintended shortcuts. So here we're gonna drive to the top of this spiral section, and the reason we do that is to load some checkpoints to better the progression system of the game because we can't skip more than 25% of the track at once, but we can just barely scrape that threshold to get that skip. What we do is just uh, hug that wall pretty tight and drop down. And then that's a really easy shortcut that I would recommend to any new runner, because um, it saves 15 seconds per lap, as opposed to doing it the intended route. Um, all you do there is just boost towards the fence and then jump over the fence and U-turn and you're able to save 15 seconds per lap. It's really easy and um, quite useful. Okay. Oh, wait. oh yeah, that's, that's a really like tight window to hit, and I had a really bad line going into it, so I'm just gonna try and back it up a little bit. 
just by going for it again. There is a nice SG that you can hit on the bottom of that hill. It's a bit ominous where the actual spot for you to hit is. So if you get it, it's great and it saves a lot of time. But if you don't, it's uh, pretty standard. Got time for a quick donation? Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have $25 from Miles, who says, you're killing it, dude. Best troll of play in CTR runner out there. Let's go, thank you, Miles. Uh, that is a longtime friend of mine who I discovered was like super into CTR when we were both uh, working at a music camp together in like uh, the summer of 2017. Or maybe even 2016, I think we worked there two summers. Yeah, had to be. Anyway. That's neither here nor there. Uh, but while I mentioned, you know, working at a music camp, um, I do just want to shout out uh, the charity incentive for Pace 2023, which is Urban Arts. Um, and as somebody who works in the field of the arts and um, also just like works in schools, um, I think it's awesome that uh, that is the charity incentive for this event. So, you know, shout out to Urban Arts for giving kids that absolutely deserve the chance to, uh, to make games, to make that a reality. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I play on a, uh, an, an adapter that lets me use a Nintendo Switch Pro Controller. Sometimes it develops a mind of its own and just does not perform any inputs. It's been really good so far, but it just sent me straight into that wall, which was pretty funny. So here's Oxide Station. Um, I hate this track. I hate this track because the shortcut is really hard. We drive into oncoming traffic. We hit Cortex there. But don't worry, I have seen much worse. So yeah, what we do is uh, we load up a portion of the track and then go right to where we loaded part of the track again and then go even further from it because we've loaded up what we needed to. And then what we do at the end of the lap um, is basically just drive normally. Before that, we do another skip that saves over 10 seconds a lap. I don't know how much it saves exactly. It's another one that new runners should learn immediately. You can go the intended route and then hit the last part of that shortcut, no problem, because all you do is just jump. But this part is really hard. We want to get onto this wall and then drop down, yup. Uh, yeah, and if we hit that little uh, piece of texture, there's a good chance we're not going to uh, land on the track. We can land on it, but it'll land in a really weird way. Oh, where are we? Wow. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, unfortunately that just landed us back on the spot where, what a missile. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that just landed us right on the spot where we, uh, set up the shortcut again. This uh, particular shortcut can be really unkind, and the fact that it's at the very uh, end of the run twice is uh, absolutely heartbreaking. I have had many PB paces die to uh, Oxide Station. Uh, it's not the first time that it'll happen, and it definitely won't be the last. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting design-wise with this track that so much of it is just condensed into the center. Like, even if, if you look at the mini-map, there's, like, little strands on the side, but the bulk of the race just happens in, like, this central core, and it just lets you do all of these crazy skips. Yeah, as you can see, I pulled up the mini-map just by hitting triangle. Uh, I just skipped a huge portion of the track there, um, which is in some ways unfortunate because, like, if you played this game when you were a kid, you were probably blown away by the fact that you go out of the space station and into outer space for a little bit with that cool anti-gravity mechanic where you jump really high. But, um, you know, we're speedrunners. We don't care about any of that. Um, anyway, so we're going to go on ahead and race Pinstripe Potteroo. Some of you might remember uh, this boss if you played Crash Bandicoot 1, which is an awesome game. Um, and yeah, shout out to the entire Crash Bandicoot speedrunning community. We've got Rico on commentary here. We've got Stump running uh, tech setup and, and help. Um, 
And the whole PS1 speedrunning community mostly crashed in Spyro, but a little bit of Ape Escape. Shout out to Ape Escape. We're going to see that at pace um, on, I think, Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. The PlayStation Nation as a whole, honestly, like there's a bunch of people who also run like PS2, PS3, PS4 games, and it's it's grown to be an extremely tight knit community. Like, like so so many like runners from like so many different PlayStation franchises just like bleed over into uh, um, into other franchises, and that was the greatest bowling bomb snipe I've ever seen. <laughs> That's extremely unlucky. Um, so Pinstripe throws bombs behind him. And the reason that that's a bit troublesome is because most of the other bosses in this game's items just despawn at will because the game can't really keep them all on the track. But bombs in this game, uh, they only explode when they hit a piece of off-road, they hit uh, a racer, or they hit a wall. And because the walls in this game are a little, or sorry, in this track are a little loosely defined, these bombs can uh, go in mysterious ways. The reason that Pinstripe hit me with that bomb on lap one was because I just tried to get in front of him and then behind him, and he took a line where the uh, bomb was just like straight in my face. That usually doesn't happen. What's more likely to happen is that um, I'll just go through the spiral skip, and then I will just run right into Pinstripe head on. It's really funny that the uh, bosses throw items behind them infinitely because for the most part, the AI just don't throw items in this game if you're far enough ahead of them, which is really nice because there's a lot less of an RNG factor uh, to this run, so it makes it pretty manageable. They can be in weird spots and uh, hit you from a distance, but it's such a rarity that it's not even really worth fretting about. But yeah, we're just going to go on ahead and take this to the end of the pinstripe race. Uh, unfortunately, on lap three, there's a large likelihood that bombs can just be, like, kind of coming our way. Because pinstripe hit us in lap one, it's actually less likely that one will be in the way because I'm going a bit slower. But yeah, we're able to finish that lap cleanly with a 43XX, which is uh, decent. If I were to hit the SG consistently on... Uh, the drop down shortcut, it would probably be a 42 or a 41. So, Pinstripe is going to do this really phoned in fake New York accent. Um, and then we are going to go on ahead and race the final boss of this game, Nitrous Oxide. The way that his mouth moves in this cutscene reminds me pretty heavily of the title screen of Super Mario 64, <laughs> where you can just kind of drag Mario's face around a bunch. And, uh, you know, Mario 64, big part of Pace 2023, so uh, shout out to that. So, also, yeah. Oxide cheats. Yeah, Oxide cheats. He goes before the 3, 2, 1, go, which is really annoying if you're running this without the skips. <laughs> and yeah, that Nitro is just squarely in our way there. Um, the items that Oxide throws behind him are like absolutely brutal. And uh, they do despawn, but there are so many of them that they can just kind of like be a conglomerate uh, in some portions of the track, which can be pretty annoying, especially on lap three, where you can just basically do all the big shortcuts and the, there might be an item staring you in the face as you land. Yeah, Oxide just uses every like power that the previous bosses did. So he throw he like tosses TNTs, drops nitros, rolls bombs, and he also he, he throws pairs of beakers. So it's it's very brutal if you do not get ahead of him. Yeah, and and all of the items that he throws are depending on his positioning on the track. So like it's a predictable cycle, but it's like if you've ever played 20XX hack pack in Super Smash Brothers Melee, there's a setting you can put on called Item Rain that absolutely chugs the game and uh, just makes items fall down pretty uh, incessantly. Um, that's basically what Oxide does. If we mess up the shortcut one more time, we'll still have Oxide lapped, 
But because we already messed it up once, as you can see, all these beakers in the way, because we already messed it up once, um, Oxide's going to be ahead of us despite the fact that we have him lapped. And we're still going to win the race. But he's going to be chucking items behind him. And th this particular portion of the track is the, the pairs of beakers. So yeah, this can be really hard to navigate around, especially on like a PB pace. But we were able to do that cleanly, and Oxide's item rain is not going to be in our way, which is awesome. So time is going to be when we cross the finish line, and uh, that's going to be coming up. And time. Okay, 54-15, that's really good. My PB is a 53-23. Um, it's a little questionable because I got that one TA skip, which saved about 23 seconds, but hey, all, you know, all's well that ends well, and uh, all's fair in love, war, and speed running. We take but those. Yes, we take those. And uh, yeah, that was Crash Team Racing, any percent, no major glitches. Uh, thank you on behalf of myself and Rico KSB for tuning in to this year Crash Bandicoot block late at night here at Pace Summer 2023. And uh, we have another awesome game that sometimes involves a car coming up afterwards with Kirby and the Forgotten Land. So uh, don't touch that dial. I do want to play one little si uh, scene in the credits just because I love the Crash Bandicoot dance, but then I will otherwise get out of your way. It's going to play the battle mode theme, which goes hard, and Crash is gonna dance for us, which is just iconic. And because we don't play as Crash, we don't get that in his podium cutscene. But I'm APA Luigi, it's 3.52 in the morning, and I need to sleep, but thank you all once again for having me, and shout out to Pace, shout out to VGBC, shout out to Xanadu, and uh, shout out to my wife, and shout out to Rico.